afternoon. Um, okay, according to that clock, I'm one minute ahead of time, but according to mine, I'm just fine. <laughs> Since I'm a Brazilian, I'm very much against starting things before the due time, but, but I think, yeah, I think it is 1.20. And thank you guys for coming. I'm Valeria de Paiva, and um, some people might have received already email from me because that some people had said that they wanted to be sitting in this course, so I, I, I sent an email to everyone who I knew about it. And if, if you haven't got a message from me and you want one, kind of send me an email. My email is valeria.depiva at gmail. And I'm going to be talking to you today about category theory for all. Um, you see, I don't want to know if you heard much about much about that, but this was supposed to be a, a course that I was going to co-teach with Ulrik Buschowski, uh, who is a PhD student in Stanford, uh, he's Saul Peckerman's PhD student. And I kind of, being an old and miserable person that I am, I was expecting Ulrik to do all the work, <laughs> you know, PhD students are supposed to do lots of work and stuff like that, and old people are supposed to just and come in, have the fun bits, talk about why things are important and why we like them and stuff like that. But Ulrich was taken ill, so um, so you have to kind of, we will all have to muddle up and you will have to cope with my lack of organization. Um, what I intend to talk to you about is why people could, should, might be interested in category theory. Then I want to talk to you about what I take, hi, come in, come in, um, what I take to be the important notions in category theory. Um, they are the first basic ones. And then we're going to talk about constructions and categories, and we're going to talk about adjunctions, and we're going to prove, hopefully, two big theorems. Um, and then, as I was saying, um, we're going to talk about glue semantics, which is something that I think it, um, is very interesting for people doing computational semantics, computational linguistics. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about the fact that it's now called category theory for all, I mean, it still is a very much a very basic introduction to category theory. But as I was saying, Ulrich wanted to make it more for functional programmers and I wanted to make it for for people interested in in computational linguistics, so we kind of vaguely uh, agreed on for all. So, so I mean, I asked the people who I knew wanted to sit in this course why they were here. I mean, I asked them, I asked every one of you, what are your your expectations? towards this course and stuff like that, because, because I think that one of the things that's very exciting about category theory is that it is very much um, used in lots of different areas um, amongst the areas that we are interested in, in something like NASLI, you know, logic, language, and information. It's pretty big, but category theory Despite being a relatively new branch of mathematics, it's been appearing more and more in textbooks, textbooks and, and texts in general, in computational semantics, the syntax semantics interface, and on, even on material pure syntax. Um, it's very prominent in the literature on functional programming, kind of very much on the literature on, on specifications of programs, and even on some stuff on, on databases, more recent stuff on databases. And thirdly, it has become very familiar in texts for physicists. And there's some good guys writing, good physicists writing about category theory. But of course, especially having to do with quantum stuff, quantum mechanics, quantum groups, topological quantum theory, quantum field theories, stuff like that. But so, and you know, People tend to have a certain difficulty with more abstract bits of mathematics. And, and of course, the, this 
the introductions and, and the introduction material that has been written about category theory normally tends to be focused on whatever the person teaching is interested in. And it's not going to be different here. I mean, the thing is too big. You can't really teach all of it. So you, you have to choose your, your wars and, and go for, for the battles that make sense. So I will kind of focus on things to do with proof theory, because what I do is categorical proof theory. So I'm going to try to cut through the woods in the direction of proof theory. And as I say, um, despite some smoke screens that you can see around us, kind of category theory is a very simple thing, but that requires certain <coughs> investment of time because you, you have to learn a new language and, and hence seems like a very good idea to teach it in a place like NASI or ASLI. And, you know, just so that everyone knows where I stand on these things, I kind of decided to put my favorite robot uh, quote here that you know, there's two ways of doing great mathematics. The first way is to be smarter than everybody else. But the second way, which is mine, is to be stupider than everybody else, but persistent. So that's, that's what, we're, what we're going to be doing. Um, that is it. Oops, one, two. Slightly slow here, so I'm sorry about that, guys. It's taking its time. trying to move it into uh, while well, I try to move it into Adobe kind of have a look at the blog I post some stuff already on the blog including the homework <coughs> and, and, and stuff like that and meanwhile while you look at that I'm kind of trying to see if I can just use instead of text shop I can use Adobe Maybe that's why it's going so slow. Sense. 
It's just called the, the, the dialectic interpretation because it appeared in a journal called the Dialectica. And what it does is, is, is a way of showing that arithmetic is consistent. That, that was uh, Gödel's way of, of showing that. But when I started working on that, what I wanted to, sh to do was not to think about arithmetic, but it was to, sh was to, I was kind of, as I was saying, I was a totally straight on algebras, and I was trying to prove that there was an internal categorical model of the dialectical, which, you know, by the end of this course on Friday, I hope you know what it means, kind of, but you don't have to know at the moment. But what happened was that the categories that I came up with, um, they proved to be a model of linear logic, which I hope you're a bit more familiar with. Um, so linear logic is, again, a slightly recent kind of logic. It was introduced by Girard in 1987. And, and linear logic kind of had a, a huge, um, huge fashion in the, in the 90s uh, because, because lots of people could look at linear logic and think of ways that they could use it. So the main idea of linear logic is that, um, is that you have a, some accounting for resources. So linguists were very taken with the idea because of course you can think, you can see very clearly that if you want to uh, to understand sentences, you normally use each bit of your sentence once. You know there are some cases where you need to reuse it and stuff like that. But by and large, you kind of use up each bit of your sentence to to produce your meaning. So linguists were very taken with it. Computer science were very taken with it. Um, but. But yeah, kind of, I think Girard himself says that, uh, that linear logic comes from a proof theoretic analysis of usual logic. And what he liked about that was this fact that you could have uh, the dualities and the symmetry of classical logic, but you could also have the constructive content <coughs> of intuitionistic <coughs> logic. And, and that's kind of, is this, this idea of construct, constructive content of proofs that I want to kind of uh, make sure that you understand more than the real mathematics. I mean, we're going to do proper mathematics. I'm kind of asking you guys to do exercises and everything. But I think the, the thing that this course could do for you more than anything else is this, ability, is this possibility of seeing how things that are in very different fields really connect in a deeper level. And that's one of the things that I really want to talk to you about. But dialectical categories were a very cool model of, of linear logic, still one of the best ones around. And, oh dear. And they, um, and they, they kind of led me to start to get interested in linguistics because for, for do, two things. One of them, because um, Jim Lumbeck kind of uh, with a picture over there, had done some work on, on, <coughs> on syntax in the late 50s, in 58, 59, on something that's nowadays called the Lumbeck calculus. And, and I kind of noticed that the dialectic categories were a model of the Lumbeck calculus, and I presented that in a, one of the Amsterdam colloquies long, long time ago. And and despite the fact, I, I, I don't know, kind of, this could be just a coincidence and something that would, might not go anywhere. And in particular, I think no one kind of really knows much about the dialectical models of the Lumbeck calculus. But then I became interested in, in this idea of glue semantics that I'm going to talk to you later on on, the, on Friday, hopefully. And that's Mary Dalrymple, who's now in Oxford, but was before in California. And she, together with John Lumping and Vinit Gupta uh, and Fernand Pereira, were the guys who kind of came with this idea of blue semantics, <coughs> which is something very interesting and will come back to us on Friday. The other thing that linear logic... Come on. Oops. This is going to be wonderful. Now I don't know why, why you misbehave. <coughs> The 
Does anyone have an idea? Because you know, I, I thought it was preview. Preview is a bit not so good, but now it's okay. I'm going to I'm going to be low level and kind of see the things. I'm sorry about that. Let's see if at least buttons here work. Yeah. So, as I was saying, kind of trying to make up this, this team of connection between things, uh, linear logic also led me to think about linear fun functional programming because of linear logic and its program of proofs as first class objects. So, I think today's team is um, proofs as first class objects. Uh, prize for anyone who can tell me. Who's this is? Who this is? You know? <laughs> Let's dumb it when he was young. Oh. <laughs> you know, normally sees him pictures of him only too old. But so dumb it's a person who we kind of associate, or well, one of the people that we associate with this program to elevate the, the status of groups to first class logical objects. So instead of asking simply when a form is true, we can ask when what is a proof? What constitutes a proof of A? And if you like to think about it in terms of Fagian, Fagian distinctions, you can think of it as saying that proofs are the sense of the logical formulas and their denotations are the truth values. Um, this idea of proof semantics is one of the unifying trends between stuff that happens in Eslis and Naslis and, and Follies and stuff like that. Uh, because, you know, some people want to call it proof semantics, some people like me want to call it categorical proof theory, um, but you don't have to, right? You can do it in, in, in philosophy if you want, and you don't have to look at the, at the category theory if you don't intend to. If you like, you'll end up out kind of straight, you can just do it in functional programming, but my thesis here is that actually it is better for everyone if you actually can move around and see all the facets of, of the phenomenon. And, I mean, someone, someone like uh, Frank Fenning in CMU, for instance, is a typical example of someone who does prove semantics, just doesn't do the categorical kind of proof theory, because he thinks that semantics in terms of lambda terms and in terms of introduction and elimination of, of lambda terms is good enough, that that's kind of meaning enough for him. I have some sympathy with this notion. I think kind of lambda calculus is a very good language in which to describe proofs. But um, I think, and I don't know how many of you would call yourselves functional programmers of some description, but I think the problem is that syntax can be very, um, people can have very good intuitions about syntax, but people can also get very misled by by their own kind of hands-on intuitions. So that's why I kind of keep pushing the idea that you should have a more abstract mathematics semantics behind you. Now the problem with this. So what's, have I got, so you know, I think I've forgotten to say one thing here. One thing that I've forgotten to say here is that, um, you know, if you're just being mathematically uh, annoying, you could say, well, um, of course, I can see why thinking about the proofs of, of, of theorems, of proofs of formulas is better than, than thinking about the true, the truthness or, or not of formulas, whether formulas are true or not, because, you know, if you know when something is a proof, then, you know, that that thing is true, so it's, um, you know, if you know about the proofs, you up, you already, you up, I already knew about truthness or not. Um, but, so you know, you might like this idea, and so why haven't people tried this much earlier than, than kind of recently? And this is kind of recently, it's been on the making, it's still not completely crystallized, but it's been on the making since the 30s, I suppose. Well, the problem is that there are lots of challenges with proof semantics. So the problem with being proofs, so you know, that's a picture of Hilbert, the first guy who kind of thought about that, I, I 
first one I know of who kind of <coughs> thought about the idea of being viewing proofs as logical objects, of mathematical objects of study. And the problem is that we do not have direct access to proofs. You see, you might think that when you write a proof, either in a proof, say, in kind of Isabel or something like that, that you actually have a direct access to that proof. But if you think a little bit about it, a bit like the, that we kind of listening to um, semantics of questions this morning, what you have is not access to the proof itself, you have access to a representation of the proof, right? And, you know, a particular representation using a particular uh, system, which tends to be, so it's a <coughs> derivation, so marks on a piece of paper on, on some particular proof system, so an axiomatic or, or an actual deduction or sequence calculus or tableau calculus, whatever. Yes, go ahead. What if you write a proof term? If you write a proof term, what you have is not a real proof. You know, what you have is a representation of a proof, yeah. right? And the point is exactly that, and thanks for asking questions because I think these things make much, things get much more fun if people discuss it. But the, the, the point is that, you know, once, once you've kind of done a tiny little bit of logic and you start saying that there are so many different ways of saying the same things, you kind of start worrying about what's the essence of this stuff. And you start worrying about, you know, what sort of characteristics I can actually move around from one proof theorem to an, from one proof theorem prover to another, one system to another. And, and I think that will be what the proof really is. Right? That's, it's like a, that's like syntax, and you can always translate between different types of proofs if you know the rules, mm -hmm. right? So. I wish, I wish we could always translate it. I and mean, we have the my, my theory is exactly that, you know, you should only call something a, a, a logic, in quotes, once you can do this stuff. Once, you know, you take your, your destination of the logic, your, your connectives, your, the, the things that you constitute, that constitute a proof on your, uh, way of thinking and you pass it on to him and you know and his way of thinking will say oh yeah that is a logic i can do proofs on my version of, of it as well so you know he, he wants to do resolution and you want to do isabel and you know you, you guys can talk about it and and that's where we when we actually have logic and real proofs it's the essence of this stuff yeah um, i'm not sure know what direct access means um, why doesn't understanding the proof sound to direct access well, I do not know. I don't know. I don't have any particular um, uh, attachment to the direct access in this case. You know what? The only thing I'm trying to convey is this idea that you know, once you have derivations in a specific and um, proof system, what you have is a representation of of, of your in turn of what you of your essence of the proof. And you know, you might call it proof too if you prefer. People sometimes. People like privates prefer to call them derivations, but the point is, it's just that um, the point is exactly this business that you want to go for the essences. You want to go for the things that actually uh, can be pushed around and manipulated in different ways, and and those things kind of are what, at least what in this class will be called proof, right? Okay. So, so I mean, I, I hope even people who kind of disagree with direct access or, or with um, uh, the fact that I'm calling this derivation a representation of a proof as opposed to a proof, I, I, I hope everyone agrees that, you know, with the second point here, which is that syntax can be very nasty as well as very nice. So syntax can um, mask times when things are the same, and it can also make, um, it can also introduce spurious difference between things that, that shouldn't be. So the example here is the traditional one, that if you prove, uh, if you prove A and B and C, or if you prove A and B and C, you know, morally, we end up with a proof of A and B and C. And it doesn't matter whether you did first the A and B and then you did the C, or if you did the, the A and then the B and C. The fact is that, um, but your system normally will make sure that you choose one direction. You can't do it 
kind of um, at the level of We are in trouble here. Oh. Stay there. Um, so semantics of proofs is what categorical logic is about, and the category theory that we will discuss will be totally directed towards uh, proof semantics. And okay, <coughs> let's see if we can move. <laughs> ah, no, I remember that I said. Oops. So things that I wanted you to. God. It's normally not that bad, seriously. So things I hope you know, and you know, I, I should have said that long before, but I hope that is all okay. I will assume some familiarity with first order predicate, predicate calculus, rudimentary knowledge of lambda calculus, just this idea that if I write lambda x, c, x, john, applied to Fred, that means that I'll, I'll just substitute the, the Fred for the x, and, and that's just the predicate. C, Fred, John. Fred gets C applied to Fred and John. And and I, I hope, I mean, I hope all of these things, this very simple symbols here are all okay for everyone, right? If they are not, let me know, but but that's going to make life difficult. Now, one of the things that would be very useful, but I'm not assuming, so you know, we will discuss quite a bit, it would be it would be very helpful to have a little bit of abstract algebra. It would be very helpful to have course of groups or linear algebra or something like that. But if you don't, no big we we can do it. I hope I dis not ah, stop thinking about that. Just use the so so what I mean I've been talking lots about categorical logic. What do I mean by that? Traditionally, mathematical logic is divided in four areas, or it was at least in the 1970s when the first handbook of mathematical logic came about, and that's John Bowles, uh, who was the main editor of the handbook. And so at that stage, we had things like proof theory, model theory, actually should be the opposite order because model theory was always more developed and more important. But so model theory, proof theory, recursion theory, and set theory. Nowadays, we have a huge tendency towards adding complexity. And complexity is a little bit complicated because you kind of can go over the other four. But in any ways, what I wanted to mention by that is that categorical logic can mean two very different things to, <coughs> to people. It could mean categorical model theory or categorical proof theory. And as I've been saying before, it will be categorical proof theory for us. And and at first approximation, I would say that categorical proof theory is just proof theory using categorical models instead of using set-based models. And, and that's kind of a very approximative sort of definition because, well, for several reasons. First one is that you might say, well, proof theory doesn't really need many models. That's not true, right? Kind of proof theory does kind of you're not going to do much model theory within proof theory, but you actually always rely on the models being there. And that's the same thing that we're going to be doing here. Um, we, we could be doing first order logic, and some people might think we should, but we are going to be doing only propositional, which is more important for us in, in this course. Um, and one of the things that's kind of sometimes very difficult is to come up with this, uh, this idea that we should be doing constructive or propositional intuitionistic logic. Uh, how many people are kind of familiar with the difference between classical and propositional logic here? Mm -hmm. Cool. Quite a few, that's great. Um, but um, lots of people are not. Lots of people have not, haven't heard of this idea that some, some proofs are constructive and other proofs are not constructive. Um, and for us, it's kind of important. I mean, in particular, people coming from, from the Netherlands, kind of, there's a little bit of a backlash against constructive logic and stuff, which is disheartening to some. But, but you know, constructive logic here won't be, um, I'm not going to make it a very philosophical position or anything like that. I'm just saying that it's a very pragmatic thing. I will, since we are talking only about propositional logic, 
the main thing that people say to you about constructive logic is that you do not have the excluded middle, so you do not have A or not A, and, and that you don't have, um, and you don't have double negation, you don't have not not A implies A. I, I prefer to think of it as, as in a more positive way, saying that actually what you will have is three independent connectives. Conjunction, disjunction, and implication are not interdefinable. Which, so, so something like A implies B is not the same as not A or B. So this, this can be seen again as two different things, right? In one hand, it can be seen as something that is a problem because it makes your systems bigger, you have to deal with more rules and stuff like that, and you have less things that you can prove easily. But I hope to convince you that, that it is worth that price. So the pictures are Gensen, Brouwer, and Bulavia. And we're going to see them again in a bit. <laughs> oh dear, I do not believe this. Um, almost to the end. What's going on with this computer? I think it doesn't like being here. It doesn't like the taxes. Okay. Right. So, my main reason for wanting to do constructive logic and constructive uh, proofs is what I'm talking about you about here. It's just this idea that if knows when you have the same proofs or different proofs. You know when you just kind of swap the, the different names of, of, of your variables, you know, if you have an alpha variant of a proof or not. Um, but so, you know, and you also know when it's a really true and new proof. So when we kind of doing traditional proof theory, traditional uh, models, such as Boolean algebras, Heiting algebras, or crypt models of whatever style you prefer, possible world styles, there are several. These models lose one important dimension in, in my understanding, because in these models, different proofs are not represented at all. So what you have is provability, right? You say that a gamma, a collection of premises of A1 to AK entails A, entails A, and this is going to be represented simply by this less than equal relation in the model. So there's no way you can say this proof of A from gamma is different from this other proof of A from gamma. So you, you, there's no way of representing the proofs themselves. <coughs> All the proofs are collapsed into this single thing that either exists or doesn't exist. By contrast, when you kind of start doing proof theory, categorical proof theory, you're going to start thinking and writing proofs as morphisms between the interpretation of your assumptions and the interpretation of your conclusion. And you're going to say that the morphism that is there is the reason why you can deduce A from gamma. So you have a name for the proof that you're thinking of from the, from the beginning. So you can observe and name and compare different derivations and you can, and having this ability, you can see subtle differences in the logics. So that's my main reason for going constructive. And as I was saying a minute ago, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, I mean, what I'm trying to do is kind of trying to convince you that, that there's this curry how the correspondence that's been uh, coalescing since, since the 30s with Curry himself. And this, uh, the version I want to, to show you uh, in this course kind of relates intuitionistic propositional logic, <coughs> which privates uh, managed to prove um, that's private. Uh, managed to prove normalization for in 1965. Um, Cartesian closed categories, which are actually what we need to work on, which Bulavia um, kind of showed how to show, how to produce how to use Cartesian closed categories to produce semantics of proofs for intuitionistic propositional logic. 
and the lambda calculus, which I couldn't find a way of putting an extra picture there, and I couldn't think really who I was going to put, because because the lambda calculus that I'm talking about here is a type lambda calculus, and um, um, and you know the issue that is complicated here is that this this these arrows are really mathematical statements, and and because it requires kind of um, because it requires that language that we're trying to learn today, and requires kind of knowing a little bit about proofs in this slightly off the wall kind of sort of logic, slightly non-traditional logic, and also requires knowing about lambda calculus, which is something that lots of people have difficulties with. The the this correspondence is not as well known as it should be. So th that's the real point of this course. And as I was saying to begin with, that is my, my reason for saying that um, functional programming, proof theory, and category theory are so intimately connected that, um, that we actually should be doing things together. Now, one thing that I would like to show you, but I'm sure I won't have time, and so I'm just going to mention it now, is that this kind of triangle, this is the basic one, the one that kind of got established around the 60s and, and is still being discussed in certain quarters, but, but we can do others, right? You know, the work that I was mentioning for my thesis and stuff is just the same triangle where instead of having intuitionistic propositional logic here, you have intuitionistic linear logic. Instead of having Cartesian closed categories here, you have symmetric one other closed categories. And instead of having functional programming there, you have linear function programming, something that's still uh, on the cards. And more interesting still, if you feel like thinking about it, there is an awful lot to be done when you kind of substitute the proof theory here for model logics, constructive model logics, categories for constructive model logics, which don't have a particular name. And, um, and that's one of the bits where the functional programmers are actually kind of giving the logicians that run for their money because the functional programmers are doing constructive model logics kind of of several different shapes and fashions. And they sometimes kind of reinvent the wheel both here and here. But that's kind of by and by. So I put lots of um, introductions to category theory in the blog for you guys to have a look at. Some of the traditional ones without links um, as I was saying, linear logic was very, uh, very fashionable in the uh, early 90s and the, the 90s in general. So we had three books, the one by Girard, Lafon, and Taylor, Proofs and Types is one of the easiest ones. Um, Mike Barr and Charles Wells, Category of Computer Science, Basic Category of Computer Science. This, this books kind of can be, most of them can be downloaded now, they, they're not so hot anymore. And more recently, you have the, this stuff about um, introduction to categories and categorical logic for physicists. That's, um, and just released, um, Harold Simmons' book is one of the ones that I mostly recommend, an introduction to category theory. Harold says in his book that the material that he's trying to cover, which is mostly what we're trying to cover, he's taking 220 pages, but he says he could be done in less than 30. Um, so, so that's, it's just that he's doing it with all the details, with all the calculations, and lots of, of help, helpful hints. So I, I, and it is available online too, so, I mean, with a few mistakes and stuff, but you can read it. Now, the, the variations, the, the more, the other kind of side of the introductions are the same for, for, um, for functional programmers. Because functional programmers kind of adapted wholesale some of the language, and now they have the opposite problem. They know that the thing is similar, they use the same words, and sometimes they're not exactly the same things. And again, if you feel like checking it out, Graham Hutton is in Nottingham, is a good friend too, and, and he has beautiful slides on introduction for functional programmers. The point of the problem with Graham's slides is, uh, the problem, the good thing about Graham's slides is that they're all handwritten. So one can't just grab it. Oh, it's difficult to grab it and use. And there's, there's two bits of, of things on YouTube because 
some of the stuff that we should be doing is much better than kind of what you see it happening bit by bit. So Eugenia Cheng, who was also a student in Cambridge, has this cat stars, cat stars YouTube channel. And, and the, problem, the problem for people like us when you, is that she and some of those guys who are very good at doing videos and stuff, they are very, oh, like Air Lab and, and Cafe, is that they are very interested in a much higher level version of category theory. They are interested in N category theory, which is a little bit complicated. Um, but yeah, that's, I think. And this one I hadn't even heard about before, this, um, this one about category theory for program construction, which is an ASL 1995, uh, and the slides are still up there, so you can check that one too. So let's kind of start finally. So I, I, before starting finally, I'm kind of saying that there's no promises on my part of completeness of the building blocks, but the basic concepts that I intend to cover are category responses, natural transformations, products, pullbacks, initial and terminal objects, adjunctions in general, and in particular, model <coughs> closure. Cartesian monoidal closure, Cartesian closed categories, and symmetric monoidal closed categories. And if we can, the Yoni and the Now, there's a whole new area of, I mean, it's not new, it's actually very old too, but there's a whole new direction where you could take this idea of <coughs> category theory for logic. And that's the area of co algebras and particularly the stories about um, quadratic model logic. Uh, I don't think we will have time for, for, for any of that. And, and the paradigm is very different. There, we are not doing categorical proof theory. We are not doing this business that I just mentioned of trying to see different proofs of the same theorem. There, we're just doing what could be called categorical model theory, just saying that you know the category sets, it's not structured enough for some of the calculations that we want to do, and we can do it, we, we can, have a much higher up view, um, an abstract version using um, models that are co-algebraic instead of, of looking at specific uh, constructions. And these are the fa fa uh, founding fathers of category theory, Sons McLean and, and Samuel, Samuel Eilenberg. So let's kind of, and, and now I'm going to start stealing people's slides because, because they can do lovely pictures. So notion of a category is a very simple notion indeed. But it kind of can, can lead to lots of discussions and you are welcome to, to start on the discussions if you want. Because the, the notion of a category is just a class of objects, a class of morphisms that some people call arrows. I tend to call them maps just because it's easy to say. And for each, for each morphism, F, like this one here, from here to there, such that there is another G starting order where the target of the F is, there must exist a composition, G composed with F. So there must exist a composition of morphisms, there must exist an identity for each object, and the only rule that we actually have really is that the composition, that composition has to be associative. So the stuff that we were talking about a minute ago about conjunction. So the idea is that if you do F <coughs> and you do G and H, and then you do F, and you do the whole thing, that's got to be the same as doing F and G, and then doing H. So the, uh, this and that is the same as this and that. Um, right. And kind of, you know, this is so simple that I think almost anything that you can think of falls into this category. Except that in language, there's lots of things that are not associative, right? So that's a bit of a, a problem. What, um, I mean, I thought we could just have a quick look at that. What do you say? Are these all categories or not? And if not, why not? Well, they are not. Well, what I just said a minute ago, I said that we have to have composition, right? Whenever I have an F and a G with this shape, 
then I have to be able to do the, the composition. So that's kind of handy because, oh, come on. I hate you. <laughs> I wanted to get to here to white categories, but the way we're going, we're not getting there. So that kind of deals with the first one, right? We're not composing the two. So, I mean, that one's okay, but this one is not. That's simple. What happens in the second line? that we didn't make so clear, which is that normally if I draw two things, then it's because they are different. Mm -hmm. So but this is, but, but this one is good because it isn't a category really. There's no way to make it a category. Um, now, <coughs> the thing that I'm saying is that categories are so ubiquitous that, uh, that, that sometimes it's difficult to think about things that that are not, I just remember syntax, it's not so associative, so it's not too bad for you guys. But, but you know, the, the first example, which is the category set, is, I mean, I'm assuming that lots of people here are interested in language, maybe because of, you know, uh, no, <laughs> good, <laughs> that's fine, <laughs> I'm just gonna, actually, can we have a show of hands? Who's coming from the more linguistics, who's coming more from the computational, who's coming more from the logic? Logic, cool. Language, cool, computation, ah, good, great. Okay, so in general, it's always good to know where you are, right? Stuff like that. So uh, the category sets is the obvious example, and it is, uh, but it is too intuitive. So maybe it's not such a good example. Um, the category, so that's what I wrote in the next one, I think, no, maybe that. Now, now it's me doing it, really. It's not, I, I want to go forward now. It's not doing it against me. So it's too intuitive. So then, um, who, who's kind of, well, up on the notion of relations and the difference between relations and functions? Everyone's okay with that? Good. It is, you know, a good example to show the difference between morphisms and real functions is the, is the category of relations, of sets and relations. You have to be a little bit careful because some people will write rel for the category where the objects are relations and the morphisms are transformations of relations. This is different from what I'm talking about here, where the, the category here, the objects are sets. And instead of using real functions between two sets, I'm using relations. And I think that's a good example if people are, remember, what they kind of, which I'm sure that high school teacher kind of bit them on their heads up with the, the, the distinction between um, functions and relations, then they understand that having relations as posing as morphisms is very different from, from most of the examples that we have. So I think, you know, I don't know how much you guys have seen about it, but it, most of the examples of category theory come from mathematics, and they come from things like groups and homomorphisms, vector spaces and linear transformations, monoids and monoids, monoids homomorphisms, you know, modules, rings, um, actions of a monoid and stuff like that. And in these examples, you always have one set and one structure that you're going to preserve. And you know, and we kind of try to talk over and over, people had saying, well, the important thing is not the objects that you have, but how they relate to, to other objects. 
So it's the morphisms that are important. But mostly, the morphisms are functions that preserve something else. It is kind of hard to see when they are not functions. And the relations are not functions, as you know. And there's, lots of, there's a few other examples that are more important along those lines. Um, in particular, we will, I mean, in particular, the need here is to kind of abstract things considerably from your normal experience. So let, let, let me backtrack just a sec to say that um, how many people have taken a course on, on linear, uh, linear algebra? Cool. When you did take a course on linear algebra, were you very surprised by the fact that first you start talking about vector spaces that we all know and love, like R2, R3, and stuff like that. And then at some stage, the instructor stopped and said, oh, now think about it and say that anything that you can have, where you have an, a scalar, a, a, have a notion of scalar, and a notion of scalar multiplication, and a notion of addition, and a notion of vector addition, anything that satisfies these things is a vector space, right? So that, that, it's that kind of conceptual, um, conceptual jump from the plain examples to the, the things that, all the things that satisfy that, that we need to do here for morphism. We need to say, okay, so long as this thing is composed, and so long as the composition is associative, and so long as for each object you can have one that the composition does nothing, the composition is the same, then we have a category. And what I kind of wanted to mention here is that kind of some examples are more complicated. And you know, you might say, well, isn't that one of the reasons why they invented category theory for to deal with topological spaces? And yes, it is. But the problem is that um, for some of the things, you have an obvious notion of what your functions should be, what they should preserve. For topological spaces, that's not so clear. And, and there's still uh, lots of discussions about that. Now, no, 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 don't do that. Now I wanted to show you the, I'll have to do something about this, this is ridiculous, I don't know what I can do though. But... Now when I want it to go, it doesn't, right? I want to do two more examples and I want to talk about monoids. <coughs> Everyone here has seen the definitions of monoids. Okay, then good, because we want to I want to do it. So just one click, it's okay. I mean, it's okay if I can get there. Uh, so okay. <coughs> I had this definition. I, I have the pictures. Then then like clicked on one of the slides and so when you press down the arrow key it's going down a line of the slides if you didn't like sometimes if you're scrolling down the thing and then you click the arrow keys it'll move back to the screen it's currently on. I'm trying to page up and they've done it. It's not working. It's kind of just I, I don't know. But I'll be very grateful for someone looking at it after. Um, so the other typical example that one needs in, in computer science is notion of partial order. So you just have that the objects are the elements of the partial order, and the morphisms are just the less than equal relation that we already discussed in connections to logic. And composition works because less than equal is transitive, of course. So you could have a very tiny one, like 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, like so. 
Then you can have a little bit more complicated one using geometric figures, <coughs> geometric shapes, and thinking about co uh, corporate figures. And, and that's where we were before, and let's, let's go to monoids. So monoids are a bit like vector spaces. It's, a, it's the same thing that we were talking a minute ago. It's about uh, saying all the things that have a, a monoid is simply a set with a multiplication-like operation and one identity, and which we normally call the element E. And, you know, nothing could be simpler than that. It's much simpler than a vector space, right? You only have one operation, the multiplication, and it is um, associative. And then you can use it for lots of other things, right? You could use it for natural numbers under addition, natural numbers and zero, natural numbers under multiplication, and the unit will be one. Reals on the multiplication. And then you can start having things that are a little bit more exciting, like matrices on the multiplication of matrices. But they have to be square matrices so that we can always, uh, so that we can, I mean, we can, multi we can compose matrices that are not square, but then you, you have to decide how to, to make sure that you're closed on this. So it's easy to get it under the square ones. And this last example is strings of, over any alphabet. I'm just using zero, 01 because, um, because I'm lazy. And the, the, of course, the operation here is concatenation, right? I make a string, I have the empty string that use, using the traditional notation I, I call lambda, but you know, functional programmers sometimes just write a square brackets and stuff. And you just uh, concatenate the strings. Um, the reason I want you to pay attention to that is that we're going to use it later on for our first example of adjunction. So kind of sit down and, 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 and play with it a bit. You see, it's not as totally trivial as it looks, right? Because, um, because there are two variations on this stuff, at least two variations. There is the strings, which are... Um, no commutative, but you could also make sequences, commutative sequences of elements of a set. And then with the same idea of, of concatenation and the same empty thing, but you just use the, make sure, make sure that the, the, the strings that, are, that you can commute around it. So and think a little bit about it. That's good. And another thing, I kind of, I'm just stealing again Eastbrook's sort of, of thoughts on why, why one should bother with category theory. And his versions are not exactly the same as mine, so I thought I was going to, to show you what he says. So he was trying to say that, that categories are good for mathematicians, and for mathematicians, they, they tend to use it fairly, I mean, quite a bit, only the language. So the, the, the thing is, I don't know. There is in, in Wikipedia and all over the place, there's some people saying that abstract nonsense is not derogatory. As far as I'm concerned, that's not true. When people, when, mat when real mathematicians, real functional analysts say that category theory is abstract nonsense, they do mean to insult. And, you know, that, but, but everyone, functional analysts, uh, cosmologists, everyone uses the language. The language has found, uh, its place in modern mathematics. Now, people like me think that it's, just, it's more than just the economy of thought and expression, and more than simply revealing common ideas in apparently unrelated areas of mathematics. Um, I think people like me say that actually the revealing the common ideas in apparently unrelated areas of mathematics actually produces new mathematics, which is the problem that traditional mathematicians have against category theory. It is true that a single result in category theory generates many results in different areas, and it's true that we have this notion of duality that um, can be used uh, in different areas to, to sometimes um, <coughs> translate uh, problems in one area to other areas where they are easier. But um, 
But yeah, kind of duality uh, by itself doesn't do much for you, right? I mean, dualities that are interesting are the ones that are actually uncover a structure that you hadn't noticed before. This is, is hard to, uh, to pinpoint, and, and, and hence some theories are much more uh, explanatory than others. And I definitely do not agree with this last point. Um, this universality and naturality in, um, in category theory are given proper meanings. You, you have a proper definition and stuff like that. But it's not clear that they actually correspond to the original uh, vague ideas. Now, for... <coughs> Same thing in preview? Yes, it was. Because, okay. um, but. Let's see. Let me try this one. Sure. Because we have the end of the course. I mean, end of tomorrow's class. Okay. <laughs> oh my. This is more complicated than I realized. <laughs> okay, this might, this might work. Much better. Good. Thank we'll, you. While you're at it, could you put the full screen view on? Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
lots of other things. Right. Uh, now, I thought I should just. Uh, how, how am I doing for time? Is that? Um, Two, Two twenty-four. Uh, yeah, minutes. and yeah, so how much <coughs> Five minutes, right? So I, I thought I should kind of mention this business of paradoxes. A person has to be at least aware that um, a person has to be aware of two things. First thing is that category theory can be used as an alternative foundation for the whole of mathematics when compared to set theory. And that's why I was kind of a little bit hesitating when I was kind of showing the first slide about categories and I do not know if you remember. I'm not going to go back there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there was a collection of objects and a collection of morphisms. <laughs> and you know, I use collection as a way of not committing myself to the size of this stuff. So I, a person has to <coughs> avoid set theoretical paradoxes, right? And oversimplifying what I say is that small collections are set big collections are classes, and I try not to pay much attention to the difference between them. So the easiest way of not paying much attention to that is to say that, well, assume that everything is at least locally small. So we say that a, a category C is a small category if both the objects and the maps between any two objects, the homomorphisms from A to B, that is all the, the maps from A to B, are sets. And sometimes you actually have to go up a bit more, and you, so you, you can you need to say that something is a locally small category um, because you kind of you can have sets of objects, but but um, but the morphisms can be a little bit bigger. So sure. Basic questions of what is what are sets paradoxes? Oh, Brussels paradox. This idea that. Um, that's kind of good thing. Um, you know that at the beginning of the century, Russell discovered this idea that you can't just say that anything is a set because some things kind of explode on you. The famous official paradox, Russell's paradox, is this idea that if you construct a set of the sets that do not belong to themselves, you end up in a paradox because the thing, if, if you think of it, if, if you look at something and you say, well, it is in the set of and the things that not belong to themselves, then it can't be there. And, you know, so that's um, the solution that mathematicians found for that, which kind of apparently sent uh, Cantor into the asylum. I think that he went, got a bit mad about the whole thing, but the solution <laughs> that mathematicians kind of found for that was to say, okay, we stratify things. You know, we think about, you know, we, we, we don't, uh, we can't have what is called generalized. Uh, comprehension, uh, unrestricted comprehension. Not everything that you can say defines a set. So we define nowadays people tend to define sets from the from the bottom up. So you say there is an empty set. That's okay, small, so, and then you can build things from the empty set up. Um, and the problem is that um, <coughs> lots of people. Well, not I don't know how many. Lots, but, but some people would like to say that category theory is a better foundation for mathematics than set theory because, um, because while it's true that any bits of mathematics you can actually translate into sets and membership, right? You know, you kind of you unpack your definitions for as much as you need to so that you end up in something that only talks about sets and membership. Um, the, the, the fact is that this cons the constructions that we have to do for that lose very much our intuitions about the things that we're dealing with. So, um, so for instance, um, you know the, the the whole construction of, of, of the natural numbers in terms of of, of sets, uh, in terms of the empty set, you know, then you can you can do lots of coding as, as people call it computer science. Because you know you you're going to code the the the, num the natural numbers as as kind of sets with the cardinality that they should have, and then you're going to code uh, rationals in terms of 
fractions and stuff, and <coughs> all, all the stuff that you do to build up the building of mathematics um, does not pay any attention to the things that need to be preserved and enhance you know, what people like me say is that set theory is a bit like a, a bit like a machine language compared to capital theory, which is much more like a, a higher order language, something like ML or Haskell or something like that. So, um, but so the point of this is that in any case, one has to to be aware that these situations. Um, that the same problems that the sectors have with things exploding on their face can happen here too. So we kind of try to, um, we try not to pay much attention to this stuff, <laughs> but kind of do some um, a priori kind of uh, safe netting. So I assume that all the categories that we discuss are at least local and small and that I mean, and these are the ones not so problematic, but I also assume that the set of morphisms uh, between objects A and B are disjoint for distinct pairs of objects. And, and this is something that I actually even was forgetting to say, but of course, um, category theory is about, um, it's about using diagrams and seeing things kind of using diagrams. So uh, if you are much more, Sure. So, how could um, a category be such that uh, two sets of morphisms for two distinct pairs of objects could fail to be disjoint? Is, don't, doesn't morphism have to have a unique Nick. first object, a unique second object? Yeah, you see, I'm kind of trying to, to straddle a line of, of not, um, depends on how you define these things, right? And you know, there, there are some people who will define it in such a way that, that each morph, every morphism comes with its uh, source and it is uh, codomain kind of attached to it. And, and that's my favorite view too. So, so then, you know, a morphism is a triple and stuff like that. Um, but there are some bad things about doing that because you, it makes it harder to talk about things like partial maps and stuff. So I think I just copied that bit uh, because I was thinking on this other uh, way of setting things up. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, lots of things in mathematics is about getting your, your, your basic definitions in such a way as they are the least troublesome later on. I, I didn't think that that was a bad one. But. But yeah, I was just copying from Harvey's work, so maybe maybe I don't need to do that. I mean, in your head, please feel free to, to say my morphisms have a domain and a codomain and it's unique, so then we don't have an issue. Um, okay. So okay, so the thing is, if you felt inclined, you could just I mean, I'm going to do lots of things drawing diagrams as you've seen already. And you can always um, you can always restate them if you like them if you like to restate them as as, as an equation. But you know I find it extremely difficult to read the equations that come out with that. And you, sometimes you see papers in category theory with a page long of, of <coughs> equations, and you know sometimes a, a diagram makes things much easier. Okay. So there's a little bit of thinking categorically that we that I think we should kind of get out of the way. So um, so the thing is that, as we said a few minutes ago, we have this identity morphisms. And one of the things that I actually wanted to check for myself, but I didn't have time, is that um, there is a there are kind of I, I wanted to find an example of. Because you know, nowadays so much easier finding things in the web. You can always kind of ask stack, stack exchange, or uh, the flows exchange and stuff like that. I wanted to find an example um, of something that failed to be a category theory just because it didn't have identities 
and one that failed to be a category theory just because you failed the associativity. From what I remember, which you know may be completely wrong, I couldn't find before something that only failed in by by, by the associativity thing. But the thing that failed just because of the identity, I, I think Edwin Robinson had an example a while back. So, you know, if anyone is feeling disposed, they can check that one. But the, the reason for this slide is not that. It's this idea that um, that inverses, um, which people normally learn in high school in terms of addition and, addition and subtraction, multiplication and division and stuff like that, though kind of it's possible to think of them just as <coughs> as so. Say that a G from B to A is an inverse of of F from A to B if composing in one direction gives you the identity in B. So doing G and then F gives you the identity in B. And composing in the other direction, first doing F and then G gives you the identity in A. And it's kind of trivial example of a proof, an algebraic proof, to show that if it exists, the inverse of f uh, is unique. You know, you just do the obvious thing. You say to yourself, assume the two, f1 and f2, and kind of, and then use the, the definition to prove that it is this, that f1 equals f2. So, um, this notion of inverse is what we're going to be using for category theory in, in general. So the, the, the whole uh, perspective here is that we want to think, we want to think <coughs> that what are the correct, the best ways of, of um, transforming, transforming our structures into other structures so that we don't have to look inside the structures. We can just look at how they related to, to each other. And, um, and that comes along with this idea that we don't want to we want we don't want to talk about equality. We want to talk about things being up to isomorphism. So the natural notion of of being the same in category theory is not even being isomorphic, but, but being isomorphic is the first step into that direction. And I did mention earlier on that some people kind of going in the directions of n categories and stuff like that. That is actually weakening the notion of equality more and more. Now, now, now it works. So, So, um, I wanted to just put uh, initial eternal objects up and I don't know what happened to initial and eternal uh, uh, empty categories and single tone categories. I thought it was before, but never mind. Um, because here we have a big fork in the road. Some people will kind of you know, we define category theory, uh, we define a category, we decide, this, we, we showed and discussed a few examples. Now, we have two possibilities. Either we're going to think about uh, ways within a category to reproduce some of the stuff that we do in set theory in general, and, and showing that these things are actually cleverer, or we can um, start talking about how um, talking about complex constructors over categories, which is what I'm doing here. That's not a, a complex one, but uh, but we will get to much more complicated ways of of, of um, sorry, no. This is the one inside the category, but there is the one outside the category, which is the constructors that I can do to categories, like putting, uh, making the products of categories and. Uh, and thinking about the, the initial terminal objects in the category of categories. So that kind of is back to that problem that we mentioned a minute ago of, of, of abstract nonsense. 
because um, one of the things that traditional mathematicians have against category theories in general is that you know, it's very easy to climb up on this ladder of, um, of abstractions um, too quickly. So we, and we don't need to go that quickly. But, but you know, if you look at the, the examples of papers and, and books that I mentioned, um, they have they have this this um, they normally have this thing that you know everyone talks about categories, and then from then on, depends on what you're going to do, what you want to do. So Goldblatt, for instance, that's a very traditional one, a philosophical one. He just stays within a category and only talks about functions long, long time at the end of the book, chapter 14. Um, um, some of, like, um, Graham Hutton, who, who I actually kind of like his slides very much, he, he kind of stays within categories and kind of um, only talks about functions and natural transformations, and that's it. He does not talk about uh, kind of adjunctions, which is what we want to end up with. It really depends on what you want to do. Kind of Benjamin Piss kind of does something kind of quite funny because he kind of stays very pedestrian, very pedestrian, very pedestrian, and at the last minute he just goes into semantics of programming language in totally kind of nose dive, so it's kind of interesting. So let's just kind of start thinking about um, constructions that we can do over categories. So we're going to say that uh, an object T is a terminal <coughs> object if for every other object of the category there is exactly one morphism that ends up on that guy. So in the category sets, it's, it's totally trivial. If any singleton set, you can send everything else from any other set to that same guy. So a terminal object is any singleton. It doesn't have to be a specific. Any singleton will have this, this property that every other object will have exactly one morphism to that. Because you, you, know, you have no choice, right? If it's a singleton set and you have a function from any set to that singleton set, you have to send everyone into the singleton. And normally, when we do the things, we do them side by side to show the, the initiality. So in this case, you're going to think, you, you're thinking to yourself that what is to be an initial object is if any, for any other object, there is exactly one morphism from the initial to that to the other object. Now here is a bit more kind of, oh, if you're thinking about this stuff in terms of, of logic, which is what I'm doing, you know, this corresponds to a true proposition because you can always, <coughs> yeah, and this one corresponds to a, the Folsom proposition because Folsom proves everything. So there's always a map from Folsom into anything. You know, somehow for me that sounds more appealing than thinking about um, the empty set that is contained in every set. It's also true, right? Empty set is contained in any set that you care to, to name, but somehow I find it more reassuring. I don't know. As Harry puts it, lots of the things in terms of the duality normally speaks better to you in one of the directions. And I think, I think as category theory, as set theory, it's much easier to see that if you have a singleton, there's only one map that ends up there. But the map that comes from the empty set to anything is a little bit, I mean, the fact that any set is contained in any other set and has to have an empty map. I find it a bit um, confusing. Um, and I think I'm going to stop here, even if it's not a 
a very perfect position, but I think I think I'm kind of messed it up myself here because I think I was going for um, products of categories and, and, and opposites of categories, and maybe maybe I'd rather kind of think about uh, things inside the category. So we carry on tomorrow talking about functors and natural transformations. And, uh, and hopefully we get to our junctions on, on Thursday and on Friday we talk about group semantics, um, which I think, you know, now that I know there aren't that many people interested in linguistics, maybe maybe it changes a little bit, but, but you know, to begin with was what I intended to do. And I'll try to put the slides up, and I'm sure since, um, since you all kind of hopefully have heard this business that this has been put together in a very hasty manner, you know, they're sure there's lots of mistakes and stuff, so feel free to send them to me, and feel free to tell everyone else that we have, that what the problems are, okay? Thank you guys. Thank you so much.